I think we'll get started uh, with our session here. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be moderating uh, this uh, specific virtual webinar on COVID-19 vaccine in kids with this esteemed panel and presenters and uh, really looking forward personally, and I'm sure many of you to a very informative session today. I I'm Dr. Sanjeev Sokolingam. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and a clinician scientist at CAMH. Uh, I'd like to just start off with just orienting people to the session, how people can stay engaged, uh, submit questions, and participate in the discussion. Uh, we have uh, enabled for this particular webinar the um, Q&A box. It's the box on your WebEx at the bottom that usually has a, a question mark on it. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question to the panel at any time during the webinar, uh, just find it on the bottom right side of your screen, um, the icon with the question mark, um, and then just send, make sure you're sending it to everyone so all the panelists can see uh, the questions. And we'll try to get through as many of them as possible. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can also submit it through the question box or their Q&A, uh, or you can email our team at pfls at camh.ca. That's pfls at camh.ca. Uh, you may have noticed that we are recording the event and the recording will only capture the panelists, myself and the slides. And that's to ensure that we can have this available for people uh, post event. Um, and closed captioning is on, so you might notice that you can uh, hover on that over the kind of caption sign up the, at the bottom if you'd like to change that, but it is uh, enabled for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to also just uh, introduce this webinar as part of uh, a series of education events and uh, webinars uh, and information as part of the uh, new RBC patient and family learning space at CAMH, uh, which will open in the McCain Complex Care and Recovery Building. That's one of our new buildings um, at uh, on Queen Street uh, when it is safe to do so uh, in the near future, we hope with the with in the context of the pandemic. Until then, the focus is on these virtual services, workshops, and presentations. Uh, so we're excited to to provide this one today. The uh, patient family learning space will act as a resource center for patients and families, and the public, uh, so that people can access health information about mental health, wellness, uh, recovery. Uh, navigation support will also be available uh, through this space and the, the uh, PFLS uh, services. Um, and the patient family learning space will also be a community hub offering workshops um, and uh, clinics like ID clinics, tax clinics to help people with various needs uh, um, and address the needs of our broader patient population. Uh, it is an education based program um, and really providing those services. So kind of with that and in, in the orientation, I, I'd like to kind of begin by just setting a little bit of context for the presentations. We'll have uh, three pre presentations today, uh, uh, starting with Dr. Renee Logan, followed by Dr. David Burt, and then uh, by Dr. Daniel uh, Buckman. Uh, many of you know the kind of province launched the uh, COVID-19 vaccines for, the, uh, for children ages 5 to 11 this morning, so very timely topic. Um, and while people are kind of signing up for vaccinations for their children, we know that for many people, there are lots of questions and information about the safety, effectiveness of the vaccines, both short term and long term uh, for this age group, uh, including things like reinfection, um, impact of variants and, and other questions. And we also recognize that there are unique complexities, uh, including ethical considerations, consent and capacity to consider within this age group. Uh, so we're hopeful that as we get through our um, uh, esteemed panel and their presentations, we'll be able to address many of these questions um, and uh, provide more information and also open up a, a space for further dialogue um, and discussion. Uh, so our, with that, I'll introduce our first presenter, Dr. Renee Logan, who will talk about the safety effectiveness um, and how the vaccines work. Dr. Logan is a family doctor and hospitalist in the Division of Medicine and Psychiatry at, at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. She's also the medical lead for COVID-19, uh, our vaccine clinic at CAMH, the medical director uh, for infection 
Prevention and Control at CAMH and a lecturer in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Her clinical work uh, involves providing primary care to patients suffering from ment uh, severe mental illness on uh, acute inpatient units, as well as the emergency department at CAMH, and she is passionate about improving access to medical care in vulnerable populations through advocacy, as well as through her involvement in teaching uh, future healthcare providers. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Logan, and I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Logan. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Sakalingam, and, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, virtual patient family uh, and learning space. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, to talk to you all today about uh, COVID-19 in kids and specifically about the vaccines that have just become available to us. So uh, if you can load my slides. Okay, thank you. So um, as was mentioned, I am uh, the medical director for infection prevention and control at CAMH. Uh, I'm a hospitalist family doctor by training um, and I'm the medical lead for the CAMH vaccine clinic, um, which we have been running for um, many, many months now um, since the beginning. Um, and we are very excited to open it up to uh, pediatric patients uh, very shortly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the first, the first thing that we really wanna think about is, is why are we vaccinating kids? Um, and so, although rare, COVID-19 can cause serious illness and death in any child. Um, kids are as likely to become infected and transmit infection as adults. Um, they are less likely to get severe disease. They are more likely to get mild disease. But the other piece that we need to keep in mind is, you know, what are the long-term effects? COVID-19 is still a new disease and we're still learning about the possible long-term effects of this illness. Another reason to consider vaccination for children uh, in this age group uh, will be that it, it protects uh, other people around them. So it reduces uh, transmission. Um, it can reduce transmission uh, by virtue of the fact that it reduces the risk of getting the illness in the first place. Um, and it also shortens the time um, that we may spread the virus if we should uh, have what is called a breakthrough infection or infection despite being vaccinated. Um, it allows kids to return to their usual activities. And I think at this point in the pandemic, this is tremendously important. Um, being at school, um, being with friends and family, participating in the usual activities, the arts and sports activities that they may have been missing out on. Um, and and these, this will allow uh, overall well-being, mental health and the development of our children um, in a way that, that they should be able to, to move forward with. So how common is COVID-19 uh, in this age category? Uh, you can put up the next slide. So in this particular slide, um, this is from Toronto uh, Public, this represents Toronto Public Health Unit. Uh, so Toronto, um, the yellow line um, marks the, uh, the incidence of COVID-19 per age group. So the top line is for under four year old, the second line is four to 11 year olds, and then it moves on up right to the 18 to 22 year olds. So what we can see here um, is that in around mid to late October, we started to see a rise in cases. So this marker over on this side for the yellow line indicates how many cases per 100,000 people in Toronto are occurring on that day in this age category. So for children in the age group of four to 11, it's somewhere in just above 35 per 100,000 in the population. Whereas the other age categories in youth, so under four, uh, 18 to 22, these are all well below 20 cases. Um, and what we know uh, across Canada is that this age group, we are seeing the, uh, the greatest uh, rise in cases. Um, so the vaccination is here at this time, and we're hoping that we can protect the kids from future uh, infections with COVID-19. You can go to the next slide. So which vaccine is being offered for our children? So on November the 19th, Health Canada approved the Pfizer mRNA pediatric vaccine. It's one third 
of the standard dose of the vaccine that we've been using for anyone who's 12 years and older. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization has recommended an eight week interval between the first and the second dose. Next slide, please. So Pfizer vaccines are mRNA vaccines. And what is in an mRNA vaccine? Well, the mRNA uh, is there um, uh, and lipids, uh, which, which coat the mRNA and protect it as it makes its way into the cell, sugars, salts, and a buffer. What is not in the mRNA vaccine? There's no egg, there's no gelatin or pork, uh, no gluten, no adjuvants, no aluminum, no latex, no antibiotics, and no preservatives. Next slide, please. So how does the vaccine work? Well, the mRNA vaccine provides a recipe to our cells. That's what mRNA is. And our, our cells build a protein that mimics the COVID-19 spike protein. Uh, the protein triggers our natural immune response to create antibodies and fight our cells. The mRNA is then broken down and it's broken down in a matter of days. The spike protein that was built by our body also breaks down within a matter of weeks. And what we're left with is the immunity that's produced by our own bodies. So when we encounter the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, our immune system will be prepared to fight off the virus so we do not become severely ill or ill at all. So what about the studies? You can go to the next slide. So initially they had to do a study to establish a dose. So um, in pediatrics, we, we think of kids as, as not being um, tiny adults, but we, and we need to figure out what doses apply uh, to their age groups. So what they found was with 10 micrograms, which is a third of the dose used in the 12 years and older, they got a good response. So once they figured out the correct dose, the next step was that they enrolled children between the ages of five and 11 to be randomized into a trial where some of the children would be given the Pfizer vaccine and the others were going to receive a placebo. And the purpose of this study was to figure out the safety of the vaccine and how effective the vaccine could be. Next slide, please. So let's start with safety. So when we talk about safety, we're talking about local reactions, systemic reactions or reactions that we feel in our bodies um, and serious adverse events. Next slide, please. So for local reactions, what we see is very typical of what we see in older folks. Um, so pain at the injection site would be the most common along with perhaps some swelling and redness at the injection site as well. And when they compared this to the previous study, um, looking at young adults aged 16 to 25, they found the rates were very, very similar. Next slide, please. So this graph, graph is very busy. Um, I'll direct your attention to the, uh, to the blue uh, square at the left-hand side. So BNT162B2 is the name of the Pfizer vaccine. So this is the group that received the vaccine and below is the, is the group that received the placebo. So the, the group that received the Pfizer vaccine, these are the systemic effects. So things like fever, fatigue, headache, chills. Uh, those are the things that we feel as a result of our immune system responding to this vaccine. And I really like this, um, this graph, despite the busyness of it all, um, because if you look um, closely, uh, the columns that are on the left of each of these boxes are representative of the children between five and under 12 years of age that received the 10 microgram or the pediatric dose. And the one on the right is the comparable group in the 16 to 25 year olds, so still young adults, who got the 30 microgram dose. And what we see is significantly less of these systemic effects. So less fever, less fatigue, less headache, less chills than the higher dose. Um, these, these will still be experienced and you can see like fatigue, it can be um, uh, you know, close to 40%. Um, and uh, so they still will experience some side effects following the vaccine, but it looks like 
they experience a little bit less than the older kids, um, than the older, the young adults, sorry, um, uh, and perhaps because of the lower dose. Next slide, please. So what about serious effects and serious events that may have occurred during the trial? Well, during the trial, they did not report any cases of anaphylaxis, which is the very severe allergic reaction that can occur rarely with the vaccine. Um, in fact, they didn't re record any serious adverse events related to the vaccine. There was no myocarditis or per pericarditis or deaths reported in the trial. Now, this trial was small um, and we're unlikely to see these types of rare events like myocarditis and anaphylaxis. So I'd like to say a few words about myocarditis. Myocarditis, you can go to the next slide, um, is a reaction that we found in people after receiving the mRNA vaccine as this was rolled out in the millions. So what did we see? It was a rare event. It, we mostly saw myocarditis in young adults, 16 to 24 years of age. And I'll just back up a moment and, and let you know what myocarditis is. Um, myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart and pericarditis is an inflammation of the lining of the heart. Um, and so this was seen more often in males. Um, and they, the interesting thing about in the adolescents was that they saw it more in the uh, 16, 17 year old adolescents than in the younger adolescents, the 12 to 15 year old uh, group. More often this occurred after the second dose. So how, how would you know if you had myocarditis after a vaccine? Well, the symptoms occur within seven days and they may uh, feel like chest pain or shortness of breath or feeling fluttering in the chest um, from a heartbeat that may be abnormal or rapid. Um, it's really important to know that from the rare events that we have seen after the vaccine, myocarditis um, uh, was not uh, connected to any uh, deaths. Um, the outcomes uh, were good. Um, it was a mild illness and uh, people recover well from it. Now, in this age category, monitoring will be ongoing because we cannot expect to get any results from the trial. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so what, what about the, how well did this vaccine work? So they measured the immune response um, and when they did their measurements, they found that there was equivalent immune response in the five to 11 year old children that they studied in this trial. When they compared them with the young adults, the 16 to 25 year olds who had received standard dose in previous trials. Now, I like this graph. Again, it's a little bit busy, I know, um, but the, the tall bars represent the antibody response measured a month after the second dose. Um, and this, this was equivalent to that of the, the 12 year old uh, and older group, um, or sorry, the 16 year old and older group from the original studies. Um, so the interesting thing about this is you can see the blue bar, the tall blue bar, is for all age categories. The tall green bar is breaking it down into the five to six year olds. And we move across purple, 78 year olds. And finally, the nine to 11 year olds in the gray. And what we see is that the immune response does not go down as the kids get older. So across all the way through age 11, we got equivalent immune response to the 10 microgram or pediatric formulation. Next slide, please. So aside from the immune, immune response, they look at what's called vaccine efficacy. So the vaccine reduces the risk of getting COVID-19, the disease, by 90% compared with the unvaccinated. So um, they looked at COVID-19 cases uh, that uh, occurred seven days following the second dose um, through the study, and they found that 16 they found 16 cases of COVID-19 in the placebo group, and, and that was 663 children in that group uh, who had not been previously infected with COVID, um, had COVID. And in the vaccine group, there were 1,305 children who had not previously been infected, and they discovered three cases of COVID in that group. And that, those are the numbers that they used to calculate how well this vaccine works. As with all vaccines, it's not 100%. 
but 90% is really good for a vaccine. Um, and I think it's important to remember that it reduces the risk by 90%. Next slide, please. So I've just illustrated this in, uh, in, a, in a picture form. So this uh, on the left side of your screen is the group in the uh, vaccine uh, group. So this represents the actual numbers of, of kids. And in red, you can see how many children got COVID-19. Um, and to the right of your screen is a representation of the, the children in the placebo group um, and the number in red um, who got COVID-19. So um, you can go to the next slide and we're just gonna, we're gonna just touch on how to prepare for your child's vaccine. So, you know, with everything that we do with our kids, it's important to review what will be happening and why. So uh, my kids are, are a little bit older now, but when they were young, it was all about prep, preparation for things, letting them know what's gonna happen. Um, and it can go a long way to alleviating some of the anxiety. Um, so you, you may, you, you may just, say to your child, you will be given a vaccine to help protect you against COVID-19. And, and um, you know, most kids now are very well aware of what's going on in the world. Um, and you will um, have a conversation about the importance of the protection um, that they will get from the vaccine. Setting expectations. So I think it's important for kids to be aware that the needle can cause pain. Um, and you can describe it to them like it will feel like a push or a pinch feeling. Um, and I think that that's important. Um, uh, you can talk to them about how to manage the pain. So you may speak to your pharmacist ahead of time about using numbing creams before coming to the clinic um, that can help to alleviate the discomfort experienced with a needle. Bringing comfort items um, uh, like blankies, stuffies, electronics um, is also a, a great idea. And to let your child pick one um, puts them in the driver's seat. Next slide, please. So at the CAMH Vaccine Clinic, we've been using what's called the CARD system. And it's a series of strategies to help uh, anybody, uh, but in, we're talking about your kids now, this will help your kids um, uh, with, their, with their vaccine. So CARD stands for Comfort, Ask, Relax, and Distract. You can go to the next slide. So, um, you know, so, this is available at the clinic, but you can also get this online and I think we'll have some resources uh, that you can uh, link to afterwards. Um, this may be something you wanna do ahead of going to the clinic to think about how your child will be most comfortable. Um, I think it is important to, to have your child wear a short sleeve shirt underneath their sweater because it makes it a lot easier to administer the vaccine. Um, uh, make sure that they have a snack beforehand. Um, allow them to ask questions. Uh, let them ask at the clinic when they get there, what will happen when it's my turn? What vaccine am I getting? Um, and uh, talk to them about what, what works best for them um, to relax or um, what they may like to distract themselves with, whether it's playing a game um, or watching a video or listening to music or talking to somebody uh, or holding your hand, whatever it may be. So, so this tool can be helpful. Um, after the vaccination, there may be some local side effects that will last for one to two days. Um, if there's anything that is lasting longer or concerns you, then you should seek medical attention. Um, we are currently recommending, um, uh, NACI made this recommendation and Ontario has followed with this, an interval of eight weeks between the first and second dose. Remember, the strongest protection occurs 14 days after that second dose. So. Uh, we all have to continue to follow public health measures, including masking and distancing. Next slide. Um, and this is the end here. Um, so the, uh, I, I'd like to talk to you about booking your vaccine. CAMH does have a vaccine clinic. You can get to it by going to camh.ca. The bookings are not open quite yet, probably by this Friday. We will be uh, having our first pediatric appointments next Tuesday, November the 30th. Um, and we will be doing pediatric only clinics on Fridays and Saturdays, starting December the 3rd. Um, if you need to book a needle phobia clinic or a metal anxiety clinic, the, um, uh, the, the page, the needle booking page will give you an email address to email someone to discuss your concerns. Thank you for listening and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Logan, for a great presentation. And so uh, we will be keeping tabs of all the questions that have come in. So please continue to 
list them there. We've uh, flagged them for our discussion period towards the end. Uh, but it, uh, I'll proceed with introducing our next uh, speaker. Um, Dr. David Burt uh, is our next speaker who will be talking about kind of reinfection of the fully vaccinated, kind of booster doses, um, and uh, again, the need for kind of protective measures in the context of vaccination. Uh, Dr. Burt is an immunologist with more than 30 years of research experience in universities and vaccine companies. He has led scientific teams involved in the development of vaccines against various infectious diseases, including influenza and SARS. He received his PhD in immunology from the University of Birmingham uh, in the UK and a uh, bachelor's of science in biological chemistry from Essex University in the UK. Uh, Dr. Burt has received the African Canadian Achievement Award in Science in 1997 and the Harry Jerome Award for Health Sciences in 2006 for his professional work and promotion of science in the community. And currently, Dr. Burt is the president of uh, DS Burt uh, R&D um, Consulting, offering independent consulting advice in biotechnology and vaccine research and development. He is a member of the City of Toronto's Black Scientist Task Force on Vaccine Equity, whose mandate is to engage communities most impacted by the pandemic around issues related to COVID-19 and the vaccines. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, hand it over to Dr. Burt for his presentation. Just looking here. Dr. Bird, our, your connection looks like it just temporarily paused on my end. Just checking. I'll give it a moment to kind of reconnect. And uh, in the interim, I do appreciate people uh, continuing to post their questions uh, in the chat as they're kind of reflecting on the information thus far. Well, maybe what we might do, uh, I do wonder if we should, uh, Dr. Bird is just reconnecting, if we should go to Dr. Daniel Buckman in the interim. Uh, just for the sake of time, because I do want to make sure we have lots of time for discussion. Uh, so we'll move things around temporarily while Dr. Uh, Bert is uh, reconnecting. Uh, doc Dr. Buckman was uh, planning on speaking after Dr. Bert, but we'll we'll be speaking on uh, the ethical considerations of uh, vaccination in the five to eleven year uh, age group, um, and also talking about consent and capacity, which is quite unique for this. Uh, uh, this patient group uh, in the context of vaccination. I'll just briefly introduce Dr. Buckman, who is a bioethicist and independent scientist at CAMH and an assistant professor in the Dalai Lana School of Public Health and a member of the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. His uh, research focuses on ethics of mental health, substance use, and chronic pain, and he's currently conducting research related to trust in COVID-19 vaccines amongst youth. And uh, Dr. Buckman is a board member in the Canadian Bioethics Society, the uh, CHR, or Canadian Institutes of Health Research Standing Committee on Ethics, and sits on the CAMH COVID-19 Vaccine Clinic Committee. So it's my pleasure. Hand it over to Dr. Buckman for his presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sockelingham. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today and to be invited to speak. On this panel with Dr. Logan and, and Dr. Burt, and um, hopefully we'll get Dr. Burt's uh, connection issues sorted out um, shortly. Such as uh, such are such are the issues that we have to deal with in in this remote environment. Um, so today I'm going to speak very briefly on issues related to consent and capacity for treatment in Ontario, and specifically how that applies to vaccines um, and consent and capacity for vaccines in, in kids. Um, um, you know, vaccines are considered a treatment and like any treatment that um, someone might receive in, uh, in Ontario or really elsewhere, um, it's critical to be able to provide consent to that treatment. Although I think as 
many folks on the on the um, on the call are aware. Um, providing consent or what that means um, in this age group can sometimes be a bit tricky. So I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about that. So first and foremost, when we talk about consent, what what do we mean? So generally, there's some there's a few elements that we want to think of when we're providing consent to a particular treatment, and this would include vaccines. So first and foremost, the consent itself must relate to the treatment. So if you're providing consent to a vaccine, you should be receiving a vaccine, right? And, you know, so you're not consenting to surgery, for example, when someone's going to administer you the vaccine, right? So it has to relate to the treatment specifically. Secondly, the consent must be informed. Well, what does informed mean? So that means that the healthcare professional who is proposing the treatment, in this case, a vaccine, must explain sort of the risks, the benefits, the consequences of accepting the treatment, as well as refusing to accept the treatment. And this doesn't necessarily mean that the healthcare professional, you know, has to go through all the raw data and the details and the, the chemical names and everything like that that might be in the vaccine, although that is really important and I think it's important for people to know. Um, it has to be at a, at, a, at a level and in a way that the person who's receiving the treatment can understand it, right? So that they can make an informed decision whether or not to accept the particular treatment for themselves. The consent also must be given voluntarily. Now, what does that mean? So if it's voluntary, that means that the person consents or agree is agreeing to receive the treatment in absence of any coercion, right? So they're not being forced to, you know, if they have the capacity to consent to the treatment, no one's saying you must do this or else, right? Um, no one's, you know, um, unduly, you know, saying um, that you, you have to receive the treatment. No one's, you know, essentially really um, saying that, you know, and this is, and we're talking specifically about people who have the capacity to consent, which I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so that the person is, you know, willingly coming forward and saying, yes, I'm going to receive this, this particular treatment. And finally, the consent must not be obtained through misrepresentation or fraud. So that means that um, the person who's providing um, the consent, you know, does so with the understanding that this is the person who's going to administer it, um, the treatment to them, is doing so in this genuine fashion. Um, there, no one's being tricked into providing consent for something that they didn't know that they're providing consent to. And all of these elements are just st generally standard informed consent principles, and is also represented in the law in Ontario in what we in, in the legislation and what we have here called the Healthcare Consent Act. So, a pop quiz for everyone on the call. You didn't think you'd get a pop quiz today. Um, what is the age of consent to treatment in Ontario? Um, I can't hear you where I'm sitting right now in, in my office. So, if you're yelling at your screen, um, what the answer is, I, I don't know. But this is sort of actually a trick question. So, the age of consent to treatment in Ontario? And the answer is, there is no age of consent to treatment in Ontario. Believe it or not, in Ontario, there is no minimum age of consent. So, it's not if you're 12, if you're 16, if you're 18, you're 19. In Ontario, there is no age of consent. So some of you are probably saying, how can this be? How, 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 my two-year-old can't consent. My five-year-old definitely cannot consent to treatment. How, how can this be? So what we have in Ontario is consent that is capacity-based versus age-based. And this applies to anyone across the age continuum of the life course from infants and little children all the way up to older adult older older ad adults so it is actually the responsibility of the healthcare professional to determine whether or not the particular person in front of them has the capacity to consent to that particular treatment so of course you know infants and preschool children you know have almost certainly not attained even a very limited definition of capacity. So, and we might think of in school age children or, you know, perhaps those like age five to 11, um, you know, are starting to develop a self-awareness of themselves and, and their bodies and the situation of what's going on. 
Um, and I think it's important, at least from an ethics perspective as well, for the clinician to respect um, and, you know, and acknowledge their growing autonomy as individuals and how this might be emerging for them. This doesn't necessarily mean they have the capacity to consent to a particular treatment, but that, you know, they may have some ideas about it, or there's certain things they may be able to understand and appreciate. So there's a two, what's called a two prong test of capacity. So to determine if someone has the capacity to consent to a treatment in Ontario, they have to first and foremost, understand the information that is relevant to deciding about the treatment. So in the case of vaccines, the person has to understand the information, you know, part of informed consent, that's relevant about the treatment itself, okay? So they have to understand what it means and how it applies to them. But they also must be able to appreciate the reasonable foreseeable consequences of a decision or a lack of a decision. So that means the decision to, let's say, accept a treatment or a vaccine, you know, vaccines as a treatment, and also what it might mean to them to not, okay? Do they appreciate what that means? So an example I sometimes give to illustrate this point is, let's say I, I, um, I happen to grow up in Canada, but let's say I grew up in a part of the world that was hot all of the time. And it was really, really hot. And someone said, okay, Daniel, you're gonna go to Northern Ontario in the middle of January. So I may understand that it is really cold in, let's say, Northern Ontario in the middle of January, but I may not appreciate what that feels like or that my decision to what it means when I choose to not bring a winter coat, right? So I may understand but not appreciate what that means. So the key here is that consent is capacity-based versus age-based, although, you know, Kids, according to their appropriate developmental stage, have many may have different levels of understanding um, and, and appreciation about the treatment that they're going to consent to. So, consent capacity in itself, in Ontario, we always presume that the person has the capacity to consent to treatment, unless proven otherwise. So, the healthcare professional that's proposing the treatment needs to determine this. Also, capacity to consent to something is task or treatment specific. So for example, um, thinking of kids or even my kids and spe specifically, they may have the, they may be able to consent to, you know, what they want to wear in the morning. Although I may question some of their fashion choices. Um, they may choose what they want to wear in the morning, but they may not have the capacity to consent to certain, let's say tr treatments or high risk treatments. Or some people may have the capacity to consent to treatment but not to, to manage their finances. So it's tasks and treatment specific. So it doesn't mean there's, there's no sort of global capacity that you can consent to everything. And finally, capacity is dynamic. It's not fixed. So, you know, we generally want to get consent from people for their treatment when they're doing their best. You know, when they've had a good night's sleep, when they're fed, um, you know, when they're not too tired, right? When they're functioning at their best. And this applies to anyone across the life course. So capacity can fluctuate. Um, and so this is, this is also important to consider. And just briefly, here's, here's, here's a, a graph. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but we wanna deter, you know, different ca capacity to consent has different thresholds, right? So for a treatment that's, let's say really, that's like high benefit, but low risk, the threshold in which we're gonna determine whether or not the person has capacity is gonna be lower then if the treatment itself is high benefit and high risk or of a low benefit and a high risk intervention. So for low benefit, high risk intervention, we're gonna to wanna to make sure the person really, really has capacity. Similarly for a high benefit and high risk, right? So as the risk goes up, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that the person really, really does have that, have that capacity to consent to that treatment. Now, what about these related concepts such as ascent or dissent? So ascent really, you know, what we might think of ascent meaning is sort of the agreement that you're gonna go along with something. And this is a very, you know, ascent first and foremost is not the same as consent. So we might look for ascent in children to agree to go along um, with a particular treatment, but it doesn't mean they're providing legal consent for that treatment. So for the assent to be valid, it must be inclusive and contextual, you know, to the to the kids or the person's circumstances. 
um, you know, in should be considered in context of familial relationships. So I think also, in, you know, in some cases that seeking and obtaining assent from kids can actually help reduce even some of the patient anxiety, you know, saying, hey, can we go along here? And so the, the, the patient, the, 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 even the child might feel like they can, they can go, they're going ahead with it. It may actually even help promote some trust between the healthcare professional and the patient, right? So that the, 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 the child, let's say in this case, feels that they're being acknowledged and, and respected as, as a person here. And it also, you know, could be consistent with their developing autonomy and self-determination. Um, you know, the clinician must assess the, the quality and adequacy of the ascent descent process. Like some kids may agree or just not agree, but it, but they may be doing that out of fear or they just don't have the intellectual capacity yet to understand what's going on. Um, now, I think as we all know, and many of us who are familiar um, with children in the 5 through 11 age range, you know, some kids may still object quite strongly or <laughs> dissent to a proposed treatment. And I think... Um, if anyone has taken their young children to vaccines, this is quite common. So I think what's really important here is that this dissent, you know, if there, if someone is providing consent on this child's behalf, that this is acknowledged. Um, but I think we should also acknowledge that in cases of like really overt dissent, um, that there is a careful reconsideration of the medical necessity, risks, and benefits of a proposed treatment. Right. So we're looking at, you know, what is the specific treatment we're talking about. What is the strong nature of dissent, um, you know, and how can we, you know, reconsider in light of the risk of benefits? Maybe and sometimes it might mean, hey, we're not going to do it right now. Maybe we'll do some things around, you know, the card um, uh, approach that Dr. Logan mentioned. Maybe find other ways to help reduce anxiety and revisit, right? There could be many different approaches and it might depend on the kids. Or maybe it means coming back another day, you know, and helping with our prep. So it might look very different depending on the kid. But I think, you know, understanding that assent and dissent are important concepts too, um, but they are not the same as consent. So, you know, if we have in Ontario a person who's unable to consent to treatment, we have to go to the law again to see who's the most appropriate person to do so. And, and this may also surprise people as well. They think, well, you know, maybe it should be, you know, their parent. Maybe it should be both parents. Maybe it should be, you know, grandparents or another guardian, right? But the law is actually very clear about who provides consent for a person who does not have capacity to consent to a particular treatment. So if we imagine a situation where a child between five and 11 does not have the capacity to consent to treatment, who should that person be? Now this text on the slide is quite um, small, but I'll just highlight some, um, some key points here. So first and foremost, we go number one, you know, the incapable person's guardian of the person, if the guardian has that authority to give or refuse consent to the treatment. Um, they may, if they have a named legal attorney, number two, legal attorney for personal care. Three, um, maybe they have a representative appointed by the board. So that's the consent and capacity board, which is, which is this legal structure in Ontario who might appoint, who sort of can adjudicate in, in consent capacity related decisions. Um, it might be the incapable person's spouse or partner. So this is not going to be apply, uh, applicable to uh, children 5 to 11 year olds, more like of adults, but so we keep going down the list until we get to the appropriate person. Um, number five, a child or parent of the incapable person um, or a children's aid society or other person who is lawfully entitled to give or refuse consent to treatment in place of the parent. Um, so this goes on about right of access. I'm not going to go into some of those details, but this a child, a, a parent of the incapable person or a guardian, a legal guardian, are most often situations who are going to provide consent for incapable children to receive the vaccine. Um, you know, number six, a parent of the capable person who has only right of access, a brother and sister of an incapable person. Now, this has to be someone. So, a brother and sister would have to actually be someone who's capable and willing and over 16 years of old, 16 years of age. And this person may even come into play if people above them on the list, including, let's say, a parent or guardian, is incapable or unavailable. And then number eight, it says any other relative than the incapable person, right? So it's not that any of these people are okay. We have to go through the list itself. And if it doesn't apply, we go to the next person. But now what happens in a situation if none of these people are available to provide consent for an incapable person? Well, then you go to the public guardian and trustee's office. So this is the office of the public guardian who would provide consent on behalf of the incapable person. 
Now, there is a little caveat here, I have to say. First and foremost, it is not, let's say there is the child is in a two parent situation. So they have two parents and both parents are able to give and provide and refuse consent for the child. In any of these categories, if there's more than one person, both have to agree. Uh oh. So what happens in situations where both parents don't agree? Well, this can get somewhat tricky. And ideally, there would be a dispute resolution. There is a dispute resolution process um, that can be very informally. And hopefully, both parents, if they're not on the same page, can come to a compromise in terms of determining what's best for the child. But sometimes this doesn't happen. And this actually went to the courts recently in, in, um, in Ontario with, um, with the 12 and up. So there's actually involved a case of, of triplets um, where two of the children lived with one parent and one of the, ch the children lived with another. Um, and there was a disagreement about getting the vaccines, getting a vaccine. And one was wanted to consent to vaccine, one did not want to consent or refuse consent to the vaccine. And this ultimately went to court. And I think going to court is a situation that nobody really wants to go to. Um, and, you know, hopefully decisions can be made, you know, in a, you know, a compromised way um, that is best for the child. And actually, so what the court, the, the judge ruled in this particular situation was that it is actually up, it's the child should receive the vaccine. The children should receive the vaccine because it is a matter of what's called best interests. So that first and foremost, that the teenagers could consent to receiving the vaccines themselves, but it should be made in context of best interest. So what's best interest? So some, there's something called the best interest standard. And this is also within our legislation in the Healthcare Consent Act in Ontario. So children, you know, are far less likely than adults to have to be able to make a strong case for their own interests. So those who are involved in their decisions, like their substitute decision makers or their parents or their guardians, um, who are affecting a child must be aware of what the child's interests are. Um, and often, I think, um, you know, speaking with my colleagues in pediatrics, children's interests are often overlooked. So why would we determine, um, how do we determine best interests and what is it? So in a situation, um, and this typically involves with, involves with adults, if we knew what their prior expressed capable wishes were for that treatment or what their values were, um, before they became incapable, that can help the decision maker in deciding how to proceed. But often with kids, with young kids in particular, we don't know what their values are. They're still very much in development. We don't know, they, they never really expressed a capable preference for treatment, especially for something like a vaccine. So um, we would go through this list here, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm gonna highlight a couple things. And so this is um, items three and four. So in making a decision, so the person who gives or refuses consent on the patient, the incapable patient's behalf should take into consideration whether the benefit the incapable person, so let's say the child in this case, is expected to obtain from the treatment, so let's say the vaccine, outweighs the risk of harm to him or her. So is the benefit that this child might receive from um, the vaccine in terms of their protection from COVID-19, in terms of the harms of you know some of the ones that um, that Dr. Logan highlighted that that children can uh, receive from um, getting COVID nineteen in terms also you know multi systemic organ failure um, and so forth long COVID issues um, you know so that's a consideration and two is there a less restrictive or less intrusive treatment that would be as beneficial as the treatment proposed so is there a less restrictive or intrusive treatment that would be as as beneficial as the vaccine well. No, not really. And, you know, the vaccines provide the most protection um, against COVID-19, COVID right? So these are the kinds of things when we think about best interests, including, you know, protection of, of the broader community in, in which we live um, in, in principles of solidarity and so forth. You know, these are, this is what we might take into consideration based in the law in Ontario around best interests. So what's the best approach to decide? Well, ultimately, it's a shared decision-making model. And this is a family-centered shared decision-making model because what this does, it best respects and supports the emerging autonomy and self-determination and capacity of the child, um, as well as parental or guardian authority 
um, in making decisions um, for their children, as well as the expertise of, of healthcare professionals. Um, you know, I think, you know, as a general rule, participation of children in their medical decision making should always be sought um, to various degrees, really depending on their interests and capabilities and their, you know, their developmental stage. Um, I think, you know, again, children should be provided with um, developmentally appropriate information and options. You know, Dr. Logan talked about this as well. You know, what to expect and what's expected to them. Hey, we're going to go to this vaccine clinic and we're going to roll up our sleeves and, you know, you know, maybe there might be a treat afterwards, or you can, you know, bring your stuffy and you can squeeze your stuffy and give it a big hug, right? Um, and that can help them, you know, participate in in a very developmentally appropriate way. So I'm going to end there, and I'm happy to take some questions um, afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Buckman. Uh, and I'll, I already see some questions there that I flagged for our discussion. Uh, I will just proceed with Dr. Burt now, who I believe has uh, connected uh, again. Dr. Burt, just checking with your audio just to see if you're available. We can't hear you. Um, maybe if you unmute, you're able to unmute. Dr. Burke. Okay. Well, I mean, while we're waiting, uh, oh, is that Dr. Burke? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Great. So you can hear me now? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay, great. I'm not sure because I'm on the phone as well, so I'm not sure. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, not a problem. Um, I'll just get straight into it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, participate. Um, and I will um, just start by saying that I'm a member of the. I'm a member of the black scientist task force on vaccine equity. It's um, one of the task forces that the city of Toronto has set up. Um, to really facilitate um, information sharing with um, different groups of the community. Um, and I'm a member of a large number of black scientists, um, doctors, healthcare professionals. And since last February, we've been um, really interacting with the community um, via a number of routes, um, town halls. We've had more than 25 town halls with different groups in the community. Um, nearly 7,000 participants. And um, usually when we have the town hall, we um, have surveys at the beginning and at the end. And on average, the town halls have seen a reduced hesitancy um, by at least 20% among the attendees. Um, so we're very pleased with that. We've also co-sponsored um, four pop-up clinics um, more than 500 um, vaccine doses distributed, mainly in mainly in young black um, black young people. Um, so we're very pleased with that. And if you go to the next slide, can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. We're, we're moving. We'll get the next slide moving here. Yeah, if you go to the next slide. You know, we've this pandemic is is um, just like the virus is is changing all the time, and we try to stay abreast of issues that affect um, the community in general, and especially our black community. And we are at the moment preparing um, a communication that will be um, distributed on our website, um, talking about the risk concerns and best advice on. Uh, vaccination of children. Um, so that that's that's we we know that that's an issue at the moment, and and that's um, one of the things that we're focusing on um, at present. So if you go to the next slide. So today I'm going to just talk to you about um, a specific issue um, that has has really um, 
impact, um, I guess, the community's um, confidence, I say confidence in, in the vaccine. And and I'm, I'm going to put this in the context of the emergence of, of variant viruses and the duration of the vaccine immunity. Um, next slide, please. We know that um, since the Delta variant has come along, um, we know that the um, variant, um, when you're infected with that variant, you have about a thousand fold more uh, virus particles in your lung um, compared with um, the previous strains of um, SARS-CoV-2. And one of the uh, consequences of that is that um, it's more likely to be transmitted to other people, and that's about 125% more transmittability, and there's a twofold higher rate of hospitalization. And we also know that the vaccines um, that um, have been described already today uh, by Rene, um, both in adults and in children, are highly effective. Um, but we know from studies from Israel and from other studies, if we can have the next slide, please, that the, that the vaccine after eight or nine months seems to um, have reduced um, ability, especially in terms of um, protecting against infection. And on, on the slide, we, we can see um, some data from the US um, comparing um, Cases, hospitalizations, and deaths um, associated with um, pre COVID, that's that line, that vertical line to the left is, is sorry, is pre um, Delta being the, the majority virus. And to the right of that line is when the Delta virus um, was, or the variant was, um, was the dominant. And the black line on the top shows. Um, information for non-vaccinated and the bottom line for vaccinated. And this, this was in, in adults. And if you look at the cases, the first um, box on the left, you see, see that before Delta was um, the, the major um, circulating variant, we find that cases for both um, uninfected and infected were dropping. But as soon as Delta became the dominant variant, we see the cases, the number of people infected, both for the um, unvaccinated and surprisingly for the vaccinating, vaccinated was going up. Hospitalizations, you see for the vaccinated, was very stable still, but for, for the um, non-vaccinated, the hospitalization rate was going up. Death rate was going up again for the unvaccinated, and was not going up so much, pretty stable for the vaccinated. So it seemed that, um, as we saw here, breakthrough infections were taking place. And, and this is information that's caused a lot of um, consternation um, for, for everyone in the community. And some individuals are saying the vaccine isn't working now. Um, what are we going to do? If you go to the next slide, this shows data for, for Canada. And it tells you that the vaccine is still um, effective um, in terms of preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death, even though we're seeing some so called breakthrough infections. Um, and if you look at the cases, um, for and this is the data from um, um, the, the, the Info Base Canada, which is on. Um, the Canadian website, and you'll see that um, in terms of the unvaccinated, the cases, hospitalizations, and deaths um, up to November, up to the end of uh, up to the end of October, November, were, were still um, high. Eighty-one percent cases, eighty-one percent hospitalizations, and seventy-seven percent deaths. In terms, in terms of the, the vaccinated, small 
top um, fraction of the vaccinated, fully vaccinated, um, have, have had cases, breakthrough cases, 7.3% in terms of cases, hospitalizations 5.6% and death 7.9%. And even for the partially vaccinated, so individuals who may have had one dose or may have been infected um, between the first and second dose or shortly after the second dose, not, not, um, not after the 14 days post second dose. So the partially vaccinated are still protected against hospitalizations and deaths. So this is showing breakthrough infections. And we're still seeing that the majority of um, Cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are found in the unvaccinated. And in the terms of the vaccinated, Health Canada and other jurisdictions have shown that what's happening is that most of the cases of breakthrough and hospitalizations and deaths are being found in the over 65s and in individuals who are immunosuppressed. And, and this isn't surprising because vaccines um vaccines sometimes the immunogenicity wanes and uh, we know that um for um hepatitis b and mmr we need three doses to get um optimal um immune responses that are protective and so in the elderly and immunosuppressed obviously the vaccines are not um functioning as efficiently as as they could and hence there's a call for um a booster, which is really a third dose. And even in the um, healthy individuals, the um, younger individuals, we know that it seems that the vaccine is, is waning in terms of its immunogenicity, but it's still protecting against severe disease, hospitalization, and deaths. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so this is similar data from the US and CDC. And in, in their studies, they said about 70% of the breakthrough cases resulting in hospitalizations were among 65 and older, and 87% of the breakthrough cases resulting in death were among adults 65 and older. Um, next, next slide. And in terms of the in terms of um, children, um, because um, most of the breakthrough cases are, are occurring in um, in the older and the immunosuppressed populations then it's probably not going to be a major factor in terms of young children. And so fully vaccinated individuals that are diagnosed with COVID-19 are still significantly protected from severe outcomes. And um, again, based on Canadian data, um, fully vaccinated people at the moment are 80% less likely to be hospitalized and 67% less likely to die as a result of their illness. Next slide, please. Um, I, I like showing this slide because it, it, it reminds us that none of the interventions and protective measures that we have against COVID-19 are foolproof, are um, perfect. And, and this is the, the famous Swiss slice, Swiss cheese slice diagram. So each slice of cheese represents one of the protective measures that we have in our arsenal against COVID-19, like masks, wear, mask wearing, um, proper hygiene, um, proper ventilation, um, social distancing, vaccines. Yes, even vaccines are not perfect. Um, if someone's if 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 you're ninety percent protective, if there's a vaccine that's that protective, it still means that ten percent there's a ten percent chance of getting infected, and the holes in these slices of cheese, as as there are in Swiss cheese, represents the fact that individually none of these um, slices are perfect, but together they can drastically reduce the chances of getting infected and passing on. Um, passing on the, the disease. And this is one of the things that I think um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of governments have, have failed to recognize, failed to recognize the fact that this is a pandemic, it's ongoing, we're still um, um, being surprised by the virus. And because it's an RNA virus, um, as Rene described, RNA viruses are 
really susceptible to um, mutations causing producing variants. And so even if a vaccine is working very well in one, at one particular time, unless the majority of individuals have been vaccinated, there's a chance that um, a variant can emerge. And that's what's happened. And unfortunately, um, many countries, uh, many states in the US have, I think, prematurely um, really thrown off some of these protective measures um, in anticipation that the vaccine was going to be um, providing all of the protection. And so we know now because the immunity of the vaccine is such that you need to have a booster and we know that the variants are emerging, it's still very important for us to utilize all of these protective measures. It's nothing to do with mandates. It's just to do with the fact that um, in reality, there's still a chance, even if you've been vaccinated, that you could contract um, a variant. Um, you might not get severe disease, but even for children, uh, once the vaccines have been rolled out, um, it's still advisable in certain situations where you're in crowds, um, where you're with people who haven't been vaccinated, to implement as much as possible as many of these protective measures including mask wearing. And uh, a recent study has shown that just wearing masks can reduce the incidence of COVID-19 by 53%. And just by so physical distancing, you can reduce the incidence by 25%. So my message really today is that the vaccines are working. They're, they're, um, they're remarkable um, interventions. And um, I, I, I think we should be celebrating the fact that we have these vaccines that are so effective, but we should always also recognize the need to still be um, wary of, of maybe opening up as, as individuals too early and ensure that we still utilize all of the protective measures that we have in our arsenal. I think I'll stop there and um, Thank you for your patience uh, as I've been dealing with this um, computer issue that I've had. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burt. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And maybe we'll just uh, ha ask all our three panelists to turn on their um, uh, videos and uh, we'll go through some of our questions. And there are a lot of questions. I just will say that if we do not get to some of the questions that are posted here, as we have some pre submitted and current questions. We will uh, be developing a, um, an FAQ sheet with uh, responses from our, our panelists to be shared with uh, attendees afterwards. So I have a, a few questions uh, that I'll start off with. Uh, there's a, a quite a few questions about safety uh, of these vaccines. Um, and so, um, you know, some of the questions and maybe uh, Dr. Logan, I'll come to you first and maybe Dr. Burt, if there's something to add to that, but um, in terms of safety, there was questions around the, uh, the uh, age discrepancy between 5 and 11 year old and wanting to know some information about the studies, if there was a good proportion across the spectrum of that age group uh, captured in these studies. And, and related to that, do we expect, based on what you showed, Dr. Logan, on side effects and dosing um, that you know, body weight would pay, play a factor into tolerability? Uh, especially a five-year-old versus a 11-year-old, for example. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, an excellent question and a burning question, I think, on most people's mind. Um, so looking at the safety of the vaccination, the study itself, the trial was done in, in the five to 11-year-olds across uh, four different countries, including Spain, the U.S., Poland, and I'm forgetting uh, Finland, I think, yeah. Uh, was the uh, was the other country? They did have children um, included who had chronic diseases that were stable, um, at, but eighty percent of the population was white. So there's not a large racialized uh, community represented in the trial data. Um, it was uh, twenty two hundred kids um, in the. Uh, in the trial that was published in the New England Journal, if you want to have a look at it yourself, um, at the so it's not a large number. So the safety that we establish when we're doing a trial like that um, is, you know, is there anything that we didn't see in the older age groups? They've looked at 12 and up now. 
anything that is showing up in younger children that didn't show up in the older groups that we need to be aware of? And the answer to that was no. In fact, a lot of the side effects that I showed in one of the slides are less frequent in this age group, um, perhaps because of a lower dose that's being used in, in this age group. Um, and then we have to look to the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is how many of these vaccine doses have gone out around the world. Um, and uh, we can use that information to help guide us to think about the rare effects. So uh, we continue to monitor uh, vaccines as we do with all vaccines and all drugs. Um, this is not specific to COVID. We continue to monitor everything after it comes to market and is used in large populations. And safety signals are being looked at all the time for everything that we use um, medication wise. So that will continue to be looked at um, in children. Do we expect long-term side effects? No, because we don't expect long-term side effects and we don't see long-term side effects from vaccines as a general rule. So when we talk about um, uh, vaccines, um, and probably Dr. Burt would be more expert than I am, but uh, what we're really talking about is the first six weeks um, and the kinds of impacts that we see uh, at that at that time frame. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, that it's very common in the five to eleven year olds. Um, to what we have been seeing in the populations um, who have received this vaccine previously uh, over the last uh, 10 months or so. Is there another part to that question or maybe I'll, I'll let Dr. Burt uh, answer. Well, Dr. Burt, did you have anything to add to that? There we go. Um, uh, um, I th yeah, I think that's that's a really important point. And, you know, historically, there aren't any cases where uh, we've seen um, vaccine-induced um, severe effects that have occurred outside of that sort of two-month window. Um, I mean, we've had some issues in the past, for instance, when the polio vaccine came along um, in the 50s. Um, when there's a bad batch of the um, inactivated polio, the paralysis that we saw in one case in like 2.4 million happened within the first one to four weeks. Um, even recently, when we had swine flu and the Guillain Barr syndrome um, was seen in, in like one in a thousand, hundred thousand cases, that was in within eight weeks. And rotavirus that causes um, bowel obstruction. Um, that virus um, or that vaccine um, caused that type of response in one case in 10,000, but that occurred within three to seven days. And historically, any severe effect that we've seen with a vaccine has happened within that sort of 60 day window. And that's why the regulatory authorities like to see data for safety within that window. So it's historically, Based on the past, it, it doesn't seem to be likely that we'll see any long-term effects. Um, but as Renee said, um, monitoring will continue, and um, you know we'll, we'll see if there are any surprises. But you know, based on historical data, um, it's, we don't expect to see anything more than we've seen with other vaccines in the past. Thank you both. Um, the next question I have is related to um, just another a couple of questions that might be quicker to answer about the timing of the COVID vaccine uh, shot and the flu vaccine. Um, if, um, you know, especially in this age group, um, if there's any concerns between kind of the, the timing of that generally and maybe specifically. So I, I can speak to the the um, <clears throat> in Ontario, um, it has been recommended to leave 14 days before or after uh, the COVID-19 shot. And that's not because we believe that there will be an interaction between the two, um, but we want to be able to ascribe any side effects that may be experienced to one or the other of the two vaccines. <clears throat> so, so far we haven't seen uh, any problems. And in fact, in the adult population, when I say adult, I mean over 12, in fact, uh, we now uh, would would say that you can do both at the same time. Um, but again, um, being prudent and knowing that this is a newer vaccine for, for this age category, we are recommending the two weeks between the two, 14 days between the two. 
Great, thank you. Um, this one is for Dr. Buckman about um, a person, um, you know, about consent capacity. What if someone is nonverbal or doesn't have the uh, mental capacity to provide in, informed consent? What would be some of the options or approaches? Thank you. That's a great question and a really important one. Um, so, first, I'll say in general, just because somebody is nonverbal doesn't mean that they don't have the capacity to consent to a particular treatment. I think in in situations like that, if if somebody is nonverbal, um, it's important as part of informed consent is to meet that person where they're at, and and able to um, present the information about the treatment in a way that they can understand. And given their abilities and how they communicate nonverbally, to under to um, to be able to respond to the question. So this, you know, I. I, I'm speaking in very generally here, but some of the strategies I've seen um, where people are nonverbal, um, they can point to pictures or sometimes they can point to words. Um, sometimes I've seen situations where people can provide yes or no sort of responses like shaking of the head um, or pointing to yes, pointing to no or things like that. And I think there's a lot of folks who do this every day. Um, and are particularly skilled at it and and can find ways and to to for, for the person who is nonverbal um, to be able to consent um, to any particular treatment and that could include vaccines as well. Um, uh, I don't have any specific resources off the top of my head here, but I would imagine folks, for example, at like Holland Bloorview um, or sick kids may be able to have some resources um, and folks who who work with people who are nonverbal. But I think I think the, imp the important point I want to emphasize is that just because someone is nonverbal doesn't mean they don't have capacity. I think often um, we may assume because the person is nonverbal that they are incapable, and so decisions are made for them when actually um, we should be finding ways to determine. Now, just be someone who may be nonverbal may also be incapable to consent to that particular treatment. But we have to be able to evaluate them. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ruckman. Um, the next question um, is about kind of uh, risk and reward. Um, and maybe this is for uh, all the panelists about, you know, the risk of uh, COVID 19 and impact on this age group and some of the um, uh, questions about long term kind of safety uh, data being available for this vaccine. And how um, we might consider those those potential risks in making decisions about kind of vaccines. I see a couple of questions related to that, so I'm combining them together for the purpose of this. But um, maybe uh, maybe we'll go to Dr. Uh, Bert first, and then uh, maybe Dr. Logan after, and then Dr. Buckman. Yeah, those those are really important important questions, and you know, especially. Um, Given the, the newness of these vaccines in terms of um, children, um, it's understandable that these are questions that you know parents are interested in. Um, and you know, like like anything that we do in life, uh, we we assess the the benefits versus the risks. And um, you know, I, I always like to to use the the example of um, you know wearing a seat a seat belt. Because um, we know the seat belts protect us from um, serious injury in a car crash, um, and that's why we wear seat belts. Hopefully, not just because we're going to find, but you know, we we believe that they're going to protect us. And you know, there's a fifty-fold chance, fifty-fold reduction in in a severe um, death injury related injury when you wear a seat belt um, if you're in the front, and a seventy-five percent reduction in a, a severe injury if you wear seat belts in the back seat. But we also know that seat belts can cause severe um, injuries themselves during an accident. Um, now, these are rare because, you know, you can get chest injuries, you can get neck injuries, and, and some of these injuries cause death. But we know that the benefits of wearing a seat belt outweigh these risks that are really um, rare. And it's the same same way we need to look at the vaccine, um, and, and one one of the one of the things that you know, in, I'm not going to go over the the issue of the long term effects because obviously we don't know, but based on history, we we don't expect any um, in in children. Um, but one of the things we do know 
um, is that many of the um, many of the severe risks, rare severe risks we see in adults, um, and we associate these with the vaccine. We we don't realize that some of these uh, things like myocarditis are um, events that we see after getting a COVID infection. Um, so, for instance, after COVID infection, um, studies have shown that there are 1,500 cases of myocarditis per million individuals. But after vaccination, uh, we've seen myocarditis in, in 12 to 17 year olds, it's reduced to 70 per million. So, 1500 per million after COVID infection versus 70 per million after vaccination in the high risk group. And this tells us that um, the benefits in terms of myocarditis, the benefits of vaccination outweigh um, any risks. And we also know that myocarditis can be treated quite, quite, um, quite well now. Um, and in many cases, individuals recover spontaneously. And it's the same with thrombosis. Um, after COVID infection, there are 39 cases per million. After vaccination, they've seen about four cases per million. So again, the benefits are outweighing the risks. And, and sometimes we forget that COVID infection is associated with these, um, these rare events that we see in um, after vaccination, at least in adults. Thanks, Dr. Burt. Uh, Dr. Logan and Dr. Buckman, anything to add? We'll go with Dr. Logan next. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, weighing the risks and benefits uh, are really important. And I think what I would like to say is, you know, as parents, um, we have an awesome responsibility. Um, we have to help uh, make this decision for our children and, and we all want what's best for our children. and We want to make the right decision. Um, so, I think it's important to to appreciate that everyone um, will have a different comfort level. I mean, some people can't wait to sign up for this vaccine um, and have already done so. Um, and others need more information. And if you need more information, that's fine. Um, I think it, I think it's important to have that comfort level when you go to make this this decision. Um, hopefully, we've given you some of that information today. Um, and I, I think the point about weighing the, the benefit and the risk is really important, knowing that in our current state, we believe that um, everybody is going to be exposed to COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV virus, the virus that, that causes COVID-19 um, over the next year. Um, and so if we have that protection on board um, and we can prevent um, even mild illness, which could lead to long-term events or the, the very rare, more severe illness, um, it's an important decision to make, um, but I would encourage you to uh, read and ask and talk to people to gain that that level of comfort. It's really important. Thanks, Dr. Logan and, and Dr. Buckman. Sure. I mean, I don't have too much to add that was already said, and I agree with <clears throat> with both of my colleagues. I mean, the, the the only thing you know that I I would say here is that often you know I think during the pandemic, many of us. Uh, as individuals and as families have, have been forced to make very individual level risk calculations of benefit and risk of everything that we've, I mean, have that we do. I mean, Dr. Bird said we do this every day, which we, we absolutely do, but I think particularly in the pandemic, this has been heightened. So I want to actually take a step back from that and say, okay, so of course we have to make an individual decision here and what's best for our kids um, on an individual level. But I'd also encourage everyone to sort of think within the ethical principle of, of solidarity. Um, which means, you know, that we are in this together. Um, I think COVID, the pandemic has demonstrated how interconnected we are as a world. And, you know, we have an obligation to one another and vaccination can absolutely not just in terms of benefit myself individually, but it also benefits others. And we exist in, we are, exist in families, we exist in communities and societies. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to think about risk benefit to the communities that they live in and the societies that they live in as well, and how the act of vaccination, act of vaccination is also is, is, a, is also could be a benefit for the greater good. Thank you, thank you all. I know we're at one thirty. We we do. If if people don't mind, I'm happy to do a couple of quick questions that I think we can answer 
Um, and again, I will just remind people that we will send out responses to other questions that have come up that we haven't had time to address. But there was a question about Tylenol use after very practical one after the vaccine. Is that okay in children? Maybe Dr. Logan, if you could comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, uh, we know that um, soreness in the arm is going to occur in the vast majority of kids who get this vaccine, um, as it does with, with us as adults. So, Tylenol will certainly help uh, reduce the pain. Um, so, Tylenol is absolutely safe to use afterwards. Often people ask about using it beforehand. I don't think there's any indication to use it beforehand. Uh, if you If you want to use something beforehand to minimize pain of the actual injection, then talk to your pharmacist about the uh, possibility of getting a numbing cream that can be put on your child's arm beforehand um, uh, and will last for uh, an hour or so afterwards um, to minimize the pain of getting the infection. But I, I generally wait before I take medication until a symptom arises. But so Tylenol afterwards is fine. Great. And and what if someone has a, Dr. Logan just says on that note, someone has a cold, not tested negative for COVID, but um, you know, has a you know runny nose, etc. Um, are they able to get the the vaccine? Um, so that's a it's a really good question. So if um, somebody has cold symptoms, uh, then we would encourage them not to come to a clinic because we don't want to spread any types of infection. Um, but if they're on the tail end, they've recovered, they've had a negative COVID test. Um, and they have a, a green light go to um, to carry on with usual activities, um, then, then that's fine. If somebody actually has COVID, um, we do uh, still recommend vaccination afterwards, um, but for that, you would need to wait until you're completely recovered from the illness. Um, so we know that you can be infectious for 10 days following uh, the, the the start of your symptoms or the test if you have asymptomatic COVID. Um, so you have to wait at least that time and we would uh, ask that you wait until your symptoms have gone away. Again, just so we don't confuse the COVID symptoms with the vaccine side effects. Great. Um, and there was a clarification about the interval between the doses, whether it was three or eight weeks. There was uh, a comment on that for the 5 to 11 uh, age group. Yeah, so the study was done uh, at a three week interval, and that's in the adult population and the pediatric population. Health Canada has approved it for that interval based on the data from the study. Um, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, so that's the, the body that reviews all of the information aside from the trial information. They look at where we're at in Canada and what is the best way forward. They have chosen an eight week and recommended an eight week interval between the two, and that's what's going to happen in Ontario. Um, so it's a delay. So it's be mindful that kids will not be fully protected until they have that second shot. Um, so, so I think that's really important to, to remember. Um, a, a couple of reasons for the, for the eight weeks. Um, uh, one, we seem to get a better, stronger response with the eight week interval. And we saw that from real world uh, data uh, from our experiences earlier in the older age group. Um, and, and there's a possibility that it may actually reduce the risk of myocarditis. Um, so that's why the longer interval. Great. I'm mindful we went over by a few minutes. We got a couple more questions in. We still have a few others, but I, what I'm going to uh, suggest is that our team will be uh, uh, taking these down and we'll be sure to kind of uh, summarize some responses uh, and again, get the input from this expert panel. I just wanted to conclude our session. Uh, today, just with uh, again a huge thank you to all three of our panelists, um, uh, Drs. Logan, Dr. Bird, and Dr. Buckman. Thank you so much uh, for this very informative um, uh, presentation. I know it's uh, not easy to summarize all this, even within the time that we had, and uh, lots of engagement as well. Uh, I will just will just mention we will make the recording available if you want to share this again. Um, with others in your family, for example, as part of a discussion. There were some questions about resources uh, for children about the immunization, you know, needle size, et cetera. We'll try to look those up for you as well and uh, include those uh, afterwards. Um, and again, we'll uh, continue to get your feedback about additional kind of topics or information that would be helpful, uh, again, related to vaccines or related uh, to the pandemic, but also more broadly as part of our uh, patient and family learning space at CAMH as well. So 
Thank you again, and uh, we hope that you're able to take away some information uh, to help your kind of decisions and information sharing amongst your groups. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you so much.